Little Miss, Little Miss, Little Miss can't be wrong. The Spin Doctors, folks. What happened to them? They wrote like three super catchy songs and then disappeared off the face of the earth. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Brian Francis. The Spin Doctors, I heard that song the other day and I just remembered how good they were. It's not fair when good bands disappear. They were underrated. By the way, today is Monday, September 24th, 2018. Underrated. The author Chuck Klosterman did a wrote an hilarious essay. He's a big music guy, if I read him. Hilarious essay about bands saying which ones. He said oftentimes when people discuss music, they talk about bands being either overrated or underrated. And Klosterman's essay focused on bands that he felt were perfectly rated, perfectly ranked. I believe he said Aerosmith is a band that is neither underrated nor overrated, just perfectly ranked. I like that. I want to go back and reread that essay because I can't remember the other bands on his list. Check him out, folks. Chuck Klosterman, author and popologist. So how's it going? We want to thank our sponsor on the podcast, Sanka. I'm only kidding. But I wish I had Sanka. I feel like Sanka would really draw in the uh, Generation Z. A little decaf Sanka. I have a cup of coffee from Wawa. Cream, no sugar. Didn't do the podcast last week. Kind of just... Don't want to, maybe I don't want to do the podcast anymore, but I do want to just kind of run uh, reruns. I just want to have the podcast in syndication and gain royalties off of syndication. Could that be arranged? So, yeah, no sugar. Trying the uh, keto. Is that how you say it? Doing a low-carb thing. We're having a low-carb situation over here for about a week now. Uh, feel fantastic. Feel great. Um, so far, sticking with it. For, I feel I feel violent is actually how I feel from eating uh, meat straight for a week. And spinach and some greenery, but mostly meats. And uh, I feel violent, but also happy. I don't know if... You can imagine carrying those two emotions simultaneously, but that's what a meat-based diet does for me. I feel like I want to hug you and beat the piss out of you at the same time. Or the crap. Or any bodily function. Just beat it right out of you. (laughs) So, I've uh, been pretty, pretty good. Good, sticking with it. Did have a slip up at the Chick Fil A. We were there the other day, and you know I try not to support Chick Fil A because of some of their politics. I tend to disagree with, but I end up going there with my kids often, and I do eat it, and it's delicious. So my act of civil disobedience is, I think to myself, this isn't that good. I've had better chicken sandwiches. This is my way of changing the world in my mind. I boycott Chick-fil-A. In my belly, I do not. I didn't even feel like I had so much meat, I didn't feel like doing the podcast. It felt too passive to do a podcast. I wanted to punch the computer, not talk at it. 
And I am an animal lover, and I feel bad about the ungodly amounts of meat I've been knocking back this past week. Uh, I do sometimes, while I'm not a vegetarian, much like my Chick-fil-A protest, I think about doing these things, which is maybe a start to think about it. But the, you know, there must have been an increase in cows, uh, cow consumption and slaughter this week solely based on my diet. Do you know this about slaughterhouses? I read this a couple of years ago. You got a big old tug of uh, this Wawa here. I read this a couple of years ago. I believe it was the author, Chuck Palinuk, oh, a second Chuck author. I'm, apparently, I'm influenced by all Chucks today. And I'm even going to cite a third one, I think, by the end of the show, because I have an idea based on a friend named Chuck. Anyway, is that, how do you say his name? The dude the Rope Fight Club, Palinuk. He said, and I don't know if this is true, but I, maybe I Googled it years ago, and I believe I did confirm that this is true. In a slaughterhouse, when cows are being led into the actual slaughter room, um, they can get very nervous because they can sense that something is afoot and awry. And uh, farmers do not want this because this could cause a stampede, could cause injury, and could cause general chaos if a cow spooks. So what they have living on the farm that is never slaughtered, never eaten, is a cow referred to as the Judas cow. Judas, J-U-D-A-S, cow. And the role of this cow is to calm and placate the other cows in the slaughterhouse and to lead the cows into the slaughterhouse by almost saying, it's okay, guys. This room's fine. Nothing to see here. It's all going to be fine. So the other cows follow the Judas cow down the hallway, into the slaughterhouse room. And then, at the moment before the massacre happens, they yank the Judas cow out by a side door, slam it shut, and I think you know what happens next. So this Judas cow, if you don't get the biblical illusion by now, Judas being the disciple that betrayed Jesus, must have quite the guilty conscience, I would imagine. Must be... What would the meat of the Judas cow taste like if you finally slaughtered the Judas cow? It must be tough and riddled with guilt tumors, I would imagine. I wrote a, I wrote a song about the Judas cow once. While I was playing, playing my guitar, I like to write little ditties on my guitar. And I thought the Judas Cow is just such an image. It's worthy of song craft. I don't think anybody liked my song. People don't like a lot of my songs. The neighbors invited me over the other day. And I wasn't like, I, I didn't feel like hanging out. Or I was out late the night before. And I just, I wasn't that into it. And then they were like, um... Yeah, but you uh, you can bring your guitar, too. <laughs> like, they tried to sweeten the pot. They worked on my uh, my vanities. They were like, no, he likes to play a good... We can tell him he can bring his guitar, and that might increase the odds that he'll show up. I didn't show, but... Mm, they're smart. They're smart. They almost had me. I did hang out with them yesterday. Watched some football with the neighbors, but... Uh, because nobody really wants me to bring the guitar. But I thought I found that very nice that they would gut out a 20 minute set list by me. Knowing that on the other side is a, is, is a hangout with me. You can bring your guitar. Oh, such flattery. <sighs> Went to see some high school football on Friday night. If you don't know, folks, I love high school sports. I particularly love high school football and high school basketball. Nothing like the fall, a nip in the air, a cup of 
coffee, ooh, and or even some hot chocolate. A sweater, the clash of the bands and cymbals and, oh, the marching band and, of course, the beautiful sport of football all under the Friday night lights. That's where I like to spend my time. And as a teacher, it's always fun to see your students on the field. And our football team is doing very well, which is sometimes not the case. So we're having a, uh, a surprisingly fantastic season, and I hope their success continues. Or even with basketball, I love when it's dead of winter, February, and it's bitter. Then you walk into that hot gym, and there's just the sounds and the smells and the uh, the whole scene of basketball, which high school basketball is so fast and so fun and exciting to watch. So that was my Friday, and I caught a great high school football game uh, with the school I teach, where I teach. Uh, versus another school, and we were victorious, and that was fun. Ooh. And, you know, I mean, I brought one of my daughters. The thing is, I'm not going to burn Eagles tickets on this girl, right? Because all she really wants at this game is a pretzel and to watch the cheerleaders. She did show some interest for the first time in football, but are you really going to burn NFL tickets on someone who's less been enthralled by the prospect. I would barely burn Eagles tickets on myself. And I'm a huge fan. Man, after they won that Super Bowl, those tickets got even more expensive. My goodness. I mean, yes, I'm glad they won. But boy, the gouge that comes with championships is quite something. My wife doesn't get the appeal of sports at all. She's like, why would you pay... You know, 200 bucks to see an Eagles game uh, and in which they could potentially lose. I said, that's the beauty of sports. It's uncertainty by its very nature. You don't know what's going to happen. We pay 200 bucks for Taylor Swift and we pretty much know what's going to happen. You're going to feel like you lost. That show was gut-wrenching in a negative way. It just went on and on and on. It just felt like Disney. This Disney thing that never ended. Um, but that's the beauty of sports. You don't know how it's going to end, my love, I said. It's not like one of your Lifetime movies that we know the husband's a jerk and he did it. This is the beauty of uncertainty. So that was Friday night. We want to start, maybe, I, we read about this uh, woman who's living in Fishtown with her husband and felt a bit alienated. I believe she had a young son or daughter, so a bit of a stay-at-home mom uh, situation. And she felt a little alienated and alone in the big city. So she started a tradition that she called, not Friday Night Lights, which is football, high school football, but Friday Night Meatballs in which she gave out essentially random invites to the first eight people that responded that would like to join her for a dinner party each Friday night. I think that would be fun. I might try that. Just throw out the invite and see what happens. I like a party when I can curate the guest list. I would get someone very liberal in there, someone conservative, someone. I would mix and match in hopes to creating an explosive Friday night. So we'll see. But how do you eliminate the blowhard? Because I know all the people that respond to this are going to be the people that I don't want to respond. That's not true. We'll see. Look for an invite. Coming soon. Friday night meatballs. Maybe. The premise being you just it's simple, it's easy, it's all about the conversation and the people and not necessarily the unbelievable prep work that goes to throwing a party. You make the meatballs, people bring wine, that's it. No more prep work beyond that. You can simple and easy for a Friday night after a long week of work. So we'll see. Maybe I'll do that. Because it does, you know, you get older, you can get a little alienated. You can get a little um, on an island. And it's good to remember to reconnect with your fellow human beings as you get older. Though I think as you get older, though, one thing is like, 
I would say after the age of 30, like you really – you don't need to make mention of your birthday that much anymore. If you're like 42 and you're like, hey, my birthday is in three weeks, it's like, what? Who cares? I feel like people that don't have children are still into their birthdays. Once you have kids, it's like your birthday is just dead. Except for the big ones. Hi, Lucy. Speaking of animals, Lucy's come to rest her head on my leg as I talk to you. How are you doing? If you're still, my birthday is in a month. It's like, what? Grow up. Grow up, sir. Your birthday. Come on. Once you have kids, they, uh, kids take your birthday from you. It's about them now. I was thinking the other day of all the hopes and dreams of mine that my kids have stolen. <laughs> I kid, kind of. No, I do. And you know, one thing, I realized this the other day, like, one, one more thing, aside from taking all of my money and my time and my youth and my talent, uh, one, one final thing that they, they stole from me, like, I don't want to do this, folks. Take this in the spirit of sarcasm. But the thought crossed my mind about how I could not do this, not to do it. It was, uh, I can't kill myself because I have kids. Uh, I could not kill myself because, you know, it would scar them so bad that, uh, they've even taken that option from me. <laughs> now, again, this is not a cry for help. I'm happy. I mean, I'm eating so much meat right now. Like, I'm invincible. I'm very happy. Very violent, but very happy. But, yeah, they took that out. They take everything from you. But you got to love them. You got to love them. What else are you going to do? So Friday night meatballs might be a way to be more social. I like being like around people. I just am not always into talking because I talk a lot for my job. So it's like a busman's holiday on a Friday night to talk again. I like going to places that give me credit for having been around people, but not necessarily having to engage with people. Like the library is a nice place. People are around, but you don't have to do anything. Coffee shops. Same deal. The gym. Planet Fitness. Fine. I get credit for being a human. But I don't have to interact. Smile and nod. Somebody wrote the perfect day would be riding your bicycle to the library. Because there is no wasted motion. The bicycle is perfect in form and function as is the library. It would be a day in which you would spend zero money, nor would you even burn any carbon emissions. That might be one of my perfect days. I gotta say, that's a great idea. A perfect day. A bike to the library. Doing a little bit of volunteering. And, uh, and then I read something about, like, well, uh, narcissists tend to do a lot of volunteer work, I guess because we subconsciously seek the praise for this. I'm like, you can't win. Try to do something good, and even that is bad. So who knows? Quit volunteering because it's, because it's bad. People are like, you should talk about, and whenever somebody says, all right, listen to the podcast, you should talk about, that never, like, works. Like, if I don't think of it, uh, I have trouble when someone else tells me what to say. Not that it's not equally funny or probably even better and more insightful, but it's just it wasn't born out of my soul. It's not mine. You, ma'am, start your podcast and you talk about that thing. I don't want to use your material. Your material is probably fantastic, but it's your material. Got an email from Groupon. You get a lot of Groupon stuff? That's when you know you're edgy, when you're totally punk rock, like Sid Vicious type, when you use a lot of Groupon tickets. Folks, don't get medical procedures uh, based on a Groupon discount. That's my advice to you. 
this Groupon ticket offered uh, two free helicopter flying lessons. I'm like, what? I've never considered flying a helicopter in my life. And now it's like, do I have to? Is this the sort of middle class suburban stuff I have to do? Are you going to post on Facebook about you flying a helicopter and that's going to make me have to do it? My family say, oh, I guess it's time for us to do the helicopter thing. No, we're not like that. We don't really function like that. But there is a part of me like, what is Groupon telling me? How does Groupon want me to live my life? Is it not fine right now? Just walking the dog and maybe listening to baseball on the radio. Do I need to fly a helicopter for your approval, Groupon? Leave me alone. I find that there are two... Um, How should I put this? Pieces of furniture that are aggressively named. Both of them are in and around the kitchen. One is the dumbwaiter. That just feels insulting. The other one that is equally insulting is a lazy Susan. A lazy Susan. Was this named after an actual Susan that was like, you know what? I just, just push that cabinet over there. Just spin it. I don't feel like getting up. Just push the door and maybe the tuna fish can will just be on the other side of it. I don't know. These are dumb jokes. If if I were a professional, I would have written more anecdotes that would branch off of the Lazy Susan observation. But I'm Lazy Brian. I did not come up with anything else beyond noting that. The Lazy Susan. What made her so lazy? I often wonder. My wife made a, a a slip of the tongue. She meant to say it's five o'clock somewhere, but she said it's fight o'clock somewhere. I like that. Given my meat high this week, my meat euphoria, I feel like it's fight o'clock somewhere. What's your fight record, folks? Your physical fight record. When's the last time you've been in a physical altercation? I would venture to say my fight record is about three, one, and one. It's a little foggy because some of these brawls were like, you know, fifth, sixth grade, a couple in high school. I would guess my last physical altercation was like late high school, early college, right around that, that time frame. Three, one, and one. Not bad. Not bad. Not lighting the world on fire. Probably not enough fights to be nationally ranked, but respectable nonetheless. I think I got in one or two fights in gym class in high school. Our high school gym class was violent. It was just like, just kill the man with the ball to use the the saying of the day. That's more politically correct than the saying that was also bandied about in that time frame. It was just it was just an all guy school, unbelievable testosterone aggression, and uh yeah, I got into a couple brawls. My whole theory with fighting is like if it's going down, I'm not I'm not the type to jaw and talk trash and mind you, you might think that I'm very verbose now on a podcast, but that's not fight Brian. That's when it's fight o'clock, I fight. I just, I generally just, if I know it's going down, I won't sucker someone, but if I know it's on, I'm swinging. Because I feel like, you know, the biggest, the biggest chance I have is if I capitalize on the element of surprise. If I just start throwing haymakers, wild and, uh, you know, flailing and some of them striking perhaps that uh, I may win this brawl due to a shock and all approach. So I go all in. You can't half fight. If you're going to fight, you have to fully commit. Spoken like an MMA fighter. You know, 
three one and one. But I'm retired. I'm retired now. Hopefully, now that doesn't discount post high school and then college, like and even yeah, you know, for a good amount of years beyond that, uh, I almost got beat down by like groups of people for for being a wise guy but that's a whole different thing a beat down by multiple people because when you're a wise guy sometimes people don't find you that funny sometimes people don't like the cut of your jib don't find you ironic sardonic they find you annoying and they want to beat the crap out of you so I've often been on the verge of getting pummeled, but I never got a true group beat down. I've always been able to sort of stun my assailants with maybe some four-syllable word and some sort of banter that is a bit confusing and just enough delay that I can slip out unscathed. But it's been close at times, folks. I'm not going to lie to you. It's been close. It's been almost <laughs> fight o'clock somewhere. And then my wife said that, and at the same party, uh, our family uh, relative said, uh, he was telling some story, and he said, yeah, because, you know, I don't know if it was blunt force drama. I said, you mean Trauma? He said, yeah, 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 blunt force trauma. But I revisited that phrase, blunt force drama. I like that better. You may recall a number of podcast episodes ago, I tallied a list of punk rock band names that I developed. I think I would add blunt force drama to that list of punk rock band names. I don't know if it edges out heartworm, but I feel like blunt force drama could at least open up for heartworm. I'm going to add that to the list. But that's not my favorite phrase, fight a clock somewhere or blunt force drama. I think my favorite phrase would have to be, that a guy, that a guy. I have a friend, yet another Chuck, who is a master at saying, that a guy. I don't know what it is about this phrase that tickles me so. I think the fact that just inherently this phrase feels unbelievably insincere. Like the speaker is clearly not interested in the subject at hand. And it's it's getting credit for speaking, but not actually listening or being engaged with anything the other person in the room has, has to say. Hey, we just won the game. That a guy. We just, uh, we just, hey, we got out of school early today. That a guy. I would misuse it accidentally. I sometimes I have difficulty listening in conversations. I start to drift a little bit. But I've managed to memorize the art of faking my way in a conversation. I can actually know when to interject. I can feel the rhythm of the thing without even knowing what the words are. And I can just really, I know when to do that. Or I even know when I ask a follow-up question. Oh, my. I did really. I did not know that. And then what did you say? Mind you, I don't know what they said to begin with, but the art of pretending to be uh, to be all there. That a guy. I think I want that on my tombstone. Here lies Brian Francis, friend, father, podcaster. That a guy. <laughs> Oh, I had a guy. So I need you to do that next time you're out and about. Give someone the old that a guy. It's the ultimate phony phrase. It's like, who are the biggest phonies in like 
advertising. Have a good one. Got on the guest soon. Still working on the, uh, got a couple interview ideas with people, but they're not too close to the podcasting home and doing some interviews over the phone. The tech doesn't sound great. So still tinkering, but I'm ready to hear from someone else. So got a couple ideas, a couple fun things in store, but join us again soon. Later.